Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this WebEx recording on suicide prevention. My name is Miriam Shabbat. I am the MFSC social worker. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, a sensitive issue. So we're talking about suicide. And, and this may be distressing for some people. Uh, some of us listening may have uh, lost a loved one to suicide, or some of us listening may even be struggling with uh, thoughts of suicide. So if you feel the need to, please reach out to me directly, or uh, you can also use the resources that are made available at the end of this presentation. So by, en by, the, end, by the end of this uh, presentation, we should be able to uh, better understand the risk factors and the warning signs that, warning signs that are related to suicide and also know how to better respond to uh, people around us who may, might be expressing having thoughts of suicide. So first of all, let's look at the words. So semantics are important when we talk about uh, the issue of suicide, especially when we're talking to someone who might be suffering, might be uh, particularly sensitive to the judgments of others. So it's best not to use some judgmental words um, that may place an additional burden on people who might not seek help for fear of judgment or fear of reprisal. So just being mindful of the language that we use when we talk about suicide, just this can help save lives. So some words are best avoided, like for example, committing suicide. So usually when we, we think of the word commit, uh, we think of uh, things like, for example, committing a sin or um, committing a crime. So it's better not to associate this with suicide. Um, the word completed or successful, successful suicide is also best avoided. These words have positive connotations, right? So one completes a project, completes a, or is successful at something. And these are words that are best not associated with, with suicide. And conversely, uh, a failed or an unsuccessful attempt, uh, it suggests that the successful outcome would have been that. And this is really not the message that we wish to convey. Uh, instead, we could try to words like uh, died by suicide, suicide survivor, or suicided, which is a neologism, but it, it, it works. Um, there's a quote here that I'd like to read. She's uh, from suicide uh, prevention specialist Susan Beaton. Uh, and she says, suicide is no longer a crime, so we should stop saying that people commit suicide. We now live in a world where we seek to understand people who experience suicidal thoughts, behaviors, and attempts, and then to treat them with compassion rather than to condemn them. Part of this is to use appropriate, non-stigmatizing terminology when referring to suicide. Okay, so the next part of this, of this uh, presentation, we'll explore some ideas about uh, suicide. So uh, I'm going to just read some uh, statements. I'd like you to think if you think that this is uh, a truth or a myth. So the first one is um, truth or myth. Talking about suicide will, will increase the likelihood of suicide. So this is a myth. Uh, so this is an outdated idea, and there is no data to support this. Most people contemplating suicide will actually be relieved uh, to have the opportunity to talk openly about what they're going through and to break the silence and isolation. Actually, in fact, some studies conclude that talking about suicide will actually reduce the risk of suicidality rather than augment it. So it would actually be the opposite. Truth or myth, uh, next one. So people who are making, uh, people who make threats of suicide are just seeking attention and it's best to ignore them. So this is a myth. Um, threats of suicide should always be taken seriously. Uh, according to some studies, uh, up to 80% of suicidal people signal their intention in some way or another, either overtly or covertly. And intervening properly, uh, appropriately when faced with threats of suicide can save a person's life. Or help, help save a person's life. Um, truth or myth, once a person has decided to die, there is nothing anyone can do to change his or her mind. So this is also a myth. Uh, suicide is seen, seen uh, by the person who's suffering as a way to solve a problem. Uh, so that's to say, solve a problem, uh, like for example, to make the, the intense psychological, emotional, or physical distress stop. And the objective is not to die. The objective is not death, but to, to, um, but to have an end to the suffering. Okay, so let's look at some data, some statistics on uh, suicide in Canada. And let's also keep in one mind, let's keep in mind when we look at uh, the data that um, all the information, the data, the stats that we have on suicide is uh, thought to be largely underestimated uh, due to a lot of different factors. Uh, one is the social stigma that's attached to the concept. 
uh, deaths by suicide may be, for example, uh, be misclassified by the police or covered up by fam family members due to shame or, or because of other social cultural factors. And this is especially true in countries where suicide is still considered a crime. But if we look at the facts, that the statistics that we have in Canada, that what, what we know, um, we know that just in Canada, on average, 10 people die by suicide every day in Canada. That's about 4,000 every year. It's one of the leading causes of death for young people in Canada, as this group uh, is le less likely to die of natural ca causes. However, it is uh, the, the age group uh, between 40 and 59 that has the highest suicide rate, as this group uses more lethal means. Um, and 45% of all suicides are, were in this age group, with males accounting for 73% of, death, of deaths within this age group. So there's an interesting phenomenon that, that happens. Um, although females are three to four times more likely than males to have suicidal behavior, males are three times more likely to die by suicide. So there's an, imp an important gender difference when we talk about suicide. Um, if we think about why this is, we're not quite sure. Uh, the, the gender paradox of suicide has been extensively studied, but we're not quite certain uh, what the causes are. Um, so it is believed that there are several factors, and one of this uh, would be the social construction of masculinity. So how boys, for example, are taught to toughen up, man up, that it's not okay to cry, uh, that it's not okay to talk about how you're feeling. So this places a, a, a barrier to seeking help, to reaching out. Um, and there's this idea that it's not manly to suffer and it's not manly to ask for help. So this feeling of isolation and inadequacy further contributes, contributes to distress. Also, men are more likely to use uh, more violent and more lethal means uh, uh, of suicide, such as firearms, for example, as they have more frequently access to these means. Let's look at some uh, risk factors when we uh, talk about suicide, and knowing what the warning signs are, what the risk factors are, can help you know when to intervene. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that suicide is not the result of one cause or one event, but it's a complex interplay of different factors, different stressors, and also having access to lethal, lethal means. Okay, so some uh, risk factors include some demographic factors, as we have just seen, so uh, adult men, are more at risk of dying uh, of suicide. The presence of mental illness, personality disorders, physical illness or chronic pain, so the more diagnoses are present, the greater the risk. Uh, substance abuse um, and suicidality are linked. Uh, for one, because people might self-medicate to non-emotional pain, and also because the abuse of substances can lower people's inhibition uh, to act on suicidal thoughts. Lack of support, Isolation, uh, we're social animals, and the experience of isolation is an extremely painful one. Also, the experience of social exclusion, so um, belonging to an ethnic, cultural, sexual minority um, is, is, uh, is, um, places people more at risk because of this idea of exclusion. Uh, if we look at, for example, First Nation, First Nation youth, uh, in Canada, the, the, the suicide rate is five to seven times higher than uh, the average, uh, the national average, and it is 14 times higher in the male Inuit population. Also, if we look at uh, transgendered people, uh, some data shows that up to 78% of transgendered people have considered suicide, and 40% would have tried to kill themselves. So the, the, the rates are extremely high uh, within, um, within the, the trans population. Uh, and this is, you know, it can be uh, linked to this idea of social exclusion and margin marginalization. Also, if we look at, um, yeah, the, the history of suicide attempts, so the more uh, a person has tried to, um, has acted into on suicidal thoughts in the past, the more likely this person will try again in the future. So this is uh, the idea of chronicity, so how long this, this has been going for, but also uh, acuity. So uh, if, per, if a person has a recent onset of suicidal thoughts, this person is also considered more at risk. Um, we know uh, that um, most suicide attempts occur within one year of having first, uh, first having suicidal thoughts. So um, if, if a person just begins to have suicidal thoughts, if this person is more at risk. Also having financial difficulties, uh, the recent experience of loss or grief, 
um, especially grief by suicide. Uh, so friends and family, having friends and family who have died by suicide, but also any loss, any grief. Uh, so it could be the loss of a job, loss of social status, uh, loss of a relationship, etc. And also other factors, um, such as a history of trauma, violence, personal characteristics, uh, such as uh, being impulsive, impulsive personality traits hopelessness, uh, and also logistic factors such as having access to lethal means, as we said, and also environmental factors such as uh, social political climate or uh, the experience of uh, imprisonment. Okay, so an acronym that you can use to um, look for the science is FACTS. So look at, let's look at the facts, the feelings, the actions, the changes, the threats, and the situation. So the feelings, we're talking about um, any emotional outbursts, such as moodiness, irritability, uh, outbursts of anger, crying, sudden, ch sudden changes of mood, and even positive, uh, seemingly positive changes. So uh, if you're confronted with a person who uh, would have appeared depressed for a long period of time and suddenly seems better, this can also be a warning sign. Um, because some people may anticipate a, a sense of relief when planning suicide, uh, thinking that suddenly um, all, all of um, that, that their suffering will be over and may appear suddenly more jovial, more excited, uh, thinking that the pain will, will be over soon. Um, so if we look at the action, so, so changes in behavior, such as becoming more recluse, uh, consulting uh, pro-suicide websites, or otherwise researching, re researching suicide, uh, an increase in risk-taking uh, behavior or kind of sorting things out, such as giving away possessions or making funeral prearrangements or uh, giving away pets or, or uh, possessions that are dear to the person. So changes, if we look at changes in personality and behavior, as we said, uh, changes in sleeping patterns, eating habits, um, loss of eating, interest in friends or, or, or activities or a sudden improvement. Uh, so what we can look out for, some external warning signs, would be weight, weight fluctuations, uh, a decrease in self-care, um, such as, you know, for example, having an unkempt appearance, uh, or, you know, the presence of new self-harm scars, or an increase or a sudden onset of substance abuse. Threats, uh, so it can be either explicit threats, such as I want to kill myself, or, Im or, ex or implicit threats, so either directly or indirectly. And some implicit statements that we can look out for would be something like, uh, well, everyone would be better off without me, or soon you won't have to worry about me anymore, or talking about being a burden to others or going away for a long period of time. Um, some situations that uh, we can look out for, so um, recent events that may trigger suicidal behaviors, such as a difficult transition, death of a loved one, divorce, loss of status, employment, etc. So any situations that might be difficult, that, may, that might be a difficult transition. So what can you do? So, well, I've, um, so this model is called the ACE model. This is a model that's been developed for the military. Uh, it's really simple. It's just three simple steps. Um, but it's very effective. So the, th the three steps are ask, care, and escort. So first of all, ask. <clears throat> so ask directly. But for, before you before you do this, I'd like to encourage people to uh, check in with yourself first. So it's it's um, it's normal to experience uh, feelings, uh, you know, such as being feeling uncomfortable, feeling concerned, feeling worried, panicked, afraid. So that's all perfectly okay and normal. So maybe just, you know, before you uh, address the person, just take a moment to check in with yourself, check in how you're feeling, um, make space for it, breathe into it, um, acknowledge these feelings, and try to remain calm. Um, find an appropriate setting for this discussion, so uh, a place where you uh, can talk about things openly without being uh, disturbed, without being distracted, and ask the question directly. Um, it can be really simple, it can be as simple as, are you having thoughts of suicide? Asking this question directly will set the tone for an honest and open discussion. <clears throat> okay. Um, the second step is to care, right? So ask care. So, you know, just be present. Just listen. Listen to what the person has to say. Uh, just being there is more important than what you're actually saying, just the act of being present and listening to the person. Um, but you can let the person speak, uh, just um, 
listen to what the person is saying, and let them know that you're, t you're taking what they're saying seriously. Most people find um, it difficult to talk about um, and may also feel guilt, may feel shame, uh, and these are all barriers to reaching out. So just, just be present, express empathy, empathy and concern, try to take a stance of non-judgment, of openness and acceptance. It's important for this person to talk and to feel understood and to break isolation. Um, don't try to convince the person that they shouldn't be feeling what they're feeling. Instead, uh, you know, check in with, with the person's emotions. Uh, you can reflect to them what you, what you see. You, you, know, you, you can say things like, you seem like you're suffering, you seem very sad. Uh, it must be difficult to feel this way. And show, um, show empathy and concern in both a verbal and nonverbal way. Um, try to create rapport and trust with the, this person, uh, things that can help. To, to create uh, this bond or using, for example, appropriate touch, um, such as holding the person's hand, putting your hand on the person's shoulder. But um, only use this if you're certain that this will be well received. You can ask the person's permission if you're not sure. Uh, another tool that you can use, something that's uh, you know simple but very effective, is using the person's first name as well if you think that it's appropriate. Um, again, you can always ask if you're not sure. And one thing that you can listen for when you're uh, having this conversation with the person is, um, what's the person living for? What are, what are the things that, um, that are keeping this person alive? So it can be children, pets, a job, et cetera. It can be uh, a lot of different things for a lot of people. But to listen to this, how, uh, how can you help this person envision positive change that, that um, the ch situation can help? So try to instill hope in this person. You know, hope can be a very positive and powerful uh, the last step is to escort. So you want to make sure that this person ha has access to, to services, has access to uh, support. But okay, in order to know where to escort this person to, it, it, it can be a good idea to have an idea of the degree of urgency of the situation. So is the person in danger right now or in the near future? Um, so some things that you can do is tr try to distinguish be between um, having passive suicidal thoughts and actively planning suicide. And asking these questions can uh, give you an idea of the emergency of the situation. Uh, so you can ask um, how, where, and when. Um, and you know, to, to know if this person has uh, defined a means of suicide, uh, if this means lethal and accessible, and just to get an idea of how detailed and specific is the plan. So if, if you think that the person needs help but may, is not in danger right now, um, you can um, accompany the person to a mental health clinician, uh, to a general pr practitioner, a crisis line, a crisis center, and assist them in making this first appointment. You also want to make sure that the environment is safe. So uh, are there any weapons in the house? Is, any, is there anything toxic or dangerous that they can use to hurt themselves? Um, if the person during this conversation has specified a means of suicide, Make sure that this means is disposed of or entrusted to someone for safekeeping. So, for example, what you can do, so if this person has access to large amounts of medication uh, that might be uh, dangerous or lethal, you can um, entrust this medication to uh, a spouse or, you know, tell them that, you know, maybe someone else can, can, take your, can hold on to your medication for, for the moment being. Uh, you can also ask a pharmacist. Uh, to give out small, you know, this person could also ask their pharmacist to um, give out small quantities at a time, so she doesn't have a lot, uh, he or she doesn't have access to uh, to a large amount. So if, um, <clears throat> yeah, of course, uh, don't uh, don't leave the person alone if you're worried for his or her safety. You can ask for permission for the person to stay uh, with you, or suggest that this person stays with someone else um, until their first appointment, for example. If the person is in danger right now, uh, you want to escort them, you want, you want to make sure that they're safe right now, right? So you can escort them to a hospital or you can call emergency services. You can be firm but gentle. For example, you can give them a choice such as, uh, would you prefer if we went to the hospital right now or if I called uh, 112 or 911 for you uh, so you can uh, go to the hospital? Uh, one of the safest places you can bring someone who, uh, who is at risk is a hospital. Uh, the hospital team will make their own assessment and they can keep a patient uh, with them, even against uh, the, the person's will with a court order, if, if this person is in danger. 
it's always best to have this person cooperate. However, um, you're responsible for his or her, her safety and his or her judgment may be uh, clouded because of uh, their situation. Um, so if you're not sure exactly what to do, you can always call emergency services and they can direct you towards the best plan of action. Uh, they're trained to deal with these kind of situation and they can respond appropriately. If you're in a situation where the person has already acted and you have you didn't have a chance to, to uh, you know, you're just confronted with, it, with, with a situation where the person has already acted in a suicidal way, so you want to call emergency services and gather as much information as you can, such as the age, the sex of the person, the address, uh, is this person conscious, is this person violent, um, if you have, uh, the more information you have, the better, uh, what means did they use, uh, what kind of medication, for example, how much, and since when. Um, things that are better avoided, so what not to do. Um, don't panic, first of all. Um, the presence of suicidal thoughts is always concerning, but it's not necessarily alarming. Many people have suicidal thoughts at some point during their lives, so, so this can be a common symptom uh, of a common mental health condition such as depression uh, or a borderline personality disorder. So it's, 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 it's common, uh, it can be a common symptom. Um, what is concerning uh, and what is alarming would be if someone would be um, actively planning suicide. So having thoughts of suicide is neither abnormal nor uncommon. It, it happens frequently to, to a lot of people during their lives. But what is um, more uh, concerning is if someone is actively planning suicide, so to distinguish between the two. Uh, things not to do, don't dismiss, minimize, threaten, judge, moralize, blame. A lot of people send hints to, to their loved ones before, um, before uh, actively uh, acting on these thoughts, so it's better um, not to, to discourage them from speaking about it. Don't assume that these are just attention, uh, that, that these acts are just a it's just part of an attention-seeking behavior. Um, even people who uh, self-harm without the intent of, uh, of dying can also accidentally kill themselves. So any uh, self-harm um, and um, threats are, should always be taken, taken seriously. Uh, don't try to solve their problems uh, or offer quick fixes. Just focus on what the person is feeling. And also don't promise to keep the situation a secret. Uh, it's not helpful to the person, and it also places an immense burden on yourself. Don't ever try to handle these kind of situ kinds of situations alone. Uh, dealing with someone who's expressing thoughts of suicide can be really emotionally draining, um, and try to get some help for yourself as well, you know, uh, get some support for yourself. And whatever happens, don't blame yourself. Uh, you can't be responsible for someone else's behavior. Okay, so let's look at some resources that you can uh, have access to. Um, so um, these are international and virtual resources that you can access. Kids Health Phone, uh, so this is, um, they offer 24-7 support with a counselor. So there's a telephone support line. There's also um, a, a support through uh, chat or with, through a forum. Uh, and they're amazing. They have uh, subjects on. They have information on a wide variety of subjects for children and adolescents. So, Family Information Line. That's specifically for us, for our community. They offer 24/7 support uh, by telephone and virtually. Uh, there's the the, the SysMap, so the the, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces Member Assistance Program, also 24/7 telephone support, and they can also refer refer you uh, to counseling. Uh, there's the the EAP, the, for the, the CFMWS EAP program, so em Employee and Family Assistance Program, uh, who offer as well 24-7 telephone counseling and refer to, referral to counseling. There's also a smartphone app. Uh, it's called My EAP. You can download that. And there's also a lot of uh, internet resources, um, so Big White Wall, uh, Samaritans.org. They offer peer support. They're specialized in suicide prevention. Um, Crise Suicidaire or Suicide Action Montréal, there, that there's, that's a really good resource. Uh, the Trevor Project for LGBTQ youth um, and International Associ Association for Suicide Prevention, I'm Alive. Um, Help Guide, that's another really great resource. Um, it's, uh, they have uh, information pages on a wide variety of mental health subjects and they have, a really good, uh, they have really good resources on suicide prevention. 
And there's also a, a few smartphone apps that can help. Uh, always there, so that's uh, Kids Help Phone, uh, Reminder, Stay Alive, Ella Friends, and Suicide Safety Plan, so they can help uh, be part of a safety plan. Uh, these uh, resources can help, but it's but I mean it's always important to um, that this person has support by uh, a qualified counselor. Um, so here are some resources in Europe. I, I geared this towards more than uh, Germany and the Netherlands, but please uh, give me a call or reach out to me if you want res resources in your area if it's not mentioned here. Um, if there's an emergency, call 112, call emergency medical services, or just go to your lo local hospitals. Uh, local chaplains are available 24-7. Myself, uh, so Miriam Shabbat, here's my phone number and my email. You can always reach out to me. Um, there's also CAF Mental Health Services, so Captain Nakaya Simar and Captain Robert who are available. Um, there are some uh, crisis resources in Europe, so there's a list here of all crisis resources in, avail, uh, available. So at IASP.info, um, if you want I can email you this, this uh, list. There's, uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this, but please bear with me, Telefon Sorge. I have no idea how to pronounce that. So in Germany, so there's um, a 24-7 crisis line. Uh, they offer services in English, but they cannot guarantee it. Um, and also in the Netherlands, there's Senso, uh, who also uh, have uh, services in English, but may cannot promise to have uh, services in English. They offer support in telephone, uh, through, by telephone, chat, and email. Um, yeah, here's some uh, resources and for further reading. If you're interested, I can email you this. Um, and this uh, concludes my, my presentation for today, so please feel free to reach out to me with any questions, any comments, any requests for counseling or support, uh, and I uh, will do my best to support you as best as I can. Uh, I hope this, that this was useful. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.